For centuries, mental disorder was considered to be due to possession by devils, and sick people were chained in foul dungeons from which few escaped alive. Guards were brutal, and treatment was non-existent. Pinnell, about 150 years ago, struck off those chains and began the medical treatment of the insane. Only in the past 20 years, however, have physical methods been developed for treatment of the mentally ill. Insulin coma and convulsive shock treatment, either by metrazole, as shown here, or by electricity, succeeded in bringing back many sick people to good health. However, there were numerous patients who relapsed after shock treatment. Many of these patients can be further benefited by psychosurgery. In 1936, Agus Moniz of Lisbon reported 20 cases of prefrontal leucotomy. Many types of operation for the relief of mental disorder have since been devised, the simplest of which is transorbital lobotomy. This operation can be performed by the psychiatrist himself. Prefrontal lobotomy is a major surgical procedure. Three fine openings are made close to the coronal suture, either laterally or superiorly. The subcortical incisions lie close to the plane of the coronal suture and sphenoidal ridge. Soon after the publications of Igas Muniz, Giamberti, an Italian psychiatrist, proposed a simpler approach to the frontal lobe through the roof of the orbit. Here the skull is thin enough to transmit light, and it can usually be perforated easily with a sharp instrument without damage to any important structures. Transorbital lobotomy has further advantages in that it leaves no scar, it is performed through an operating field that is normally sterile, and the stiff tarsal plate forms an ideal reinforced dressing. Transorbital lobotomy can therefore be performed without the need for elaborate precautions against hemorrhage and infection. In this cadaver study, the leucotome is driven through the orbital plate parallel with the bony ridge of the nose, and cuts are made at 5 and 7 centimeters, followed by the deep frontal cut. For purposes of brevity, this scene is speeded up. The procedure is repeated on the opposite side. Five centimeters, seven centimeters, and the deep frontal cut. In order to mark the location of the incisions, some methylene blue is injected. Following this, the brain is removed in the usual fashion. Bluey stain appears in the anterior fossa and around the base of the brain. Wherever the blue is found in the cadaver study, there may be blood in the operative face. Notice that there is no escape of dye into the longitudinal tissue where the anterior cerebral artery lies. The points where the instrument perforates the orbital plate lie rather far laterally and at a distance from the frontal sinus and optic nerve. After fixation, the brain is sectioned. The bluish staining indicates that the incisions have penetrated all the way across the white matter into the ventricle. The deep frontal cut severs most of the fibers in the thalamofrontal radiation and does not increase the danger of operation. This specimen came from a patient who died of cancer shortly after transorbital lobotomy. The points of entrance of the leucotome are inconspicuous and there is no external hemorrhage. On section, it can be seen that there is a small amount of blood in the ventricular cavities. The incisions have penetrated the white matter of the frontal lobe almost to the ventricles, but they do not involve the cortex to any degree. A section lower down toward the base shows that oblique incisions avoid branches of the middle cerebral artery going into the frontal operculum. The deep frontal cut severs most of the radiation from the thalamus to the tip of the frontal pole. Section at a higher level shows that the transverse incisions are located entirely in the white matter and are relatively free from hemorrhage.
This is a normal brain in which the medial surface has been cut away. The pointer demonstrates the thalamus, cerebellum, and brainstem, and the anterior thalamic radiation going to all parts of the frontal lobe. The difference between the location of the incisions in the major lobotomy and in the transorbital lobotomy is shown by the instruments in the corresponding positions. Major lobotomy, transorbital lobotomy. The hand with the fingers extended demonstrates in three dimensions the course of the fibers from the thalamus to the frontal lobe. The thalamus is represented by the wristwatch. The fibers to the motor area go upward like the thumb to the convexity. Those to the frontal pole run forward like the second and third fingers, while those to the base curve around the anterior horn of the ventricle like the fourth and fifth fingers. It is possible, therefore, as illustrated by the leucotome, to sever the fibers to the frontal pole by the lateral and medial cuts, and then to sever those to the base of the frontal lobe by elevating the handle of the instrument. The connections between the thalamus and the frontal lobe are clearly shown in this illustration from Flexig's monograph on myelinization of the infant brain. The projection pathways from the thalamus to the occipital and temporal lobes are well myelinated, as well as those to the frontal projection. Beyond the anterior horn of the lateral ventricles, the radiation bends rather sharply toward the midline and a sort of elbow. It is the aim of transorbital lobotomy to cut across this tract of fibers close to the elbow. Turning now to the operation itself, very little preparation is necessary for transorbital lobotomy. This patient came to the hospital this morning after breakfast, and if all goes well, she will leave tomorrow afternoon. The operation can be done under any general anesthetic, but electroshock is preferred because of its familiarity to the psychiatrist. Transorbital lobotomy is performed during the stage of post-convulsive coma. The electrodes are applied, and the first shock is given. The convulsion lasts about 40 seconds. When the patient shows signs of returning consciousness, a second convulsion is administered. Usually three successive convulsions are necessary, but in old people a single one may be sufficient, while in a sturdy young person four or even six convulsions may be administered without danger. Now that the convulsion has subsided, the nurse holds a towel over the nose and mouth of the patient. The operator lifts the upper eyelid, inserts the leucotome into the conjunctival sac, and aims it parallel with the bony ridge of the nose. He drives the point through the orbital plate, and at a depth of five centimeters, swings the handle far laterally. He then returns the instrument to a slightly oblique position, still parallel with the bony ridge of the nose, and drives it two centimeters further. Steadying the patient's head, he then moves the handle of the instrument about 20 degrees medially and 30 degrees laterally. In this latter position, he strongly elevates the handle of the instrument, often fracturing the orbital plate. and then finally returns the instrument to the parasagittal plane. The operation on the left side is seen from the profile view, which best illustrates the deep frontal cut.
It will be noted that the instrument upon removal appears clear and shiny, but in view of its contact with the skin of the lower eyelid, different instruments are used for operation on the two sides. In this second patient, after operation, there is no damage visible. Thank you.